they would one of the tricks they would do is straw foot hay foot. So you get a piece of straw, which means it's hollow, put it on one, one of the feet, and then a piece of hay, which is just flat on the other foot, and they would teach them how to march straw foot hay foot, straw foot hay foot, and then eventually transition into right foot, left and right. But I mean, that's how basic this is for some of these guys. Harsh discipline in the Prussian army is reserved for trained soldiers, because if they screw up, they know better. They deserve to be punished because they know better and you got to fix that right away. An attitude correction, as they would say in the modern military. It has to happen right away. Not to interrupt, but the book I'm reading that I chose is going over everything you're teaching. I'm just like, oh, shoot. <laughs> so there you go. The training is progressive and sequential, meaning we don't do, we don't hand somebody a musket on day one. We start with right foot, left foot. We start with very basic things and work our way up to the more complex. Because if you do it any other way, it's not rational. I mean, it's just that simple, it's just not rational. To hand somebody a musket who doesn't even know how to march, what sense does that make? So I mean, they might be marching with literally wooden rifles in the sense of it's a hunk of wood that has been carved into the shape of a rifle just so they have something to hold on to while they march. But you're not giving them a real musket. There's no point to it. There's an emphasis on the essentials. What do you need to be a good soldier? What are the essential characteristics of a good soldier? We're gonna focus on those things. Not on advanced things. Not on you trying to be a hero on the battlefield. Because that's not what we're worried about. We're worried about everybody acting as a group. Because of the smoothbore muskets where you can't even really aim at a target much. It's all about you as a group acting, not you as an individual act. And lastly, speed, not precision, is sought because you can't be precise when you're firing your musket. It's a smooth war musket. The more shots you fire, the more likely one is going to hit. Exactly. Because it's not going perfectly straight, it's not going exactly where you want it to go. So you throw as much lead downfield as possible. Statistically, your chances of hitting something go up. So you're going to learn to load, aim, fire as fast as possible sequentially. Keep going. And so this is kind of counter to what we think of when we think of this kind of rigid discipline of the Germans, or in this case, the Prussians. Now, again, if you're a trained soldier and you screw up, oh yeah, yeah, there's going to be there's going to be a consequence. But if you're not a trained soldier, we're going to take it slowly. We're going to work you up to that. And his training is unique in Europe at that time. Nobody else is doing it this way. And quite frankly, on some of these. These are, this is how we do train. You start with the basics. You start very unessential items and you work your way up. They're not giving somebody an M4 or an M16 on the first day of basic training. You work up to it. So, these battles that are gonna be fought during Frederick's reign are ugly. They are, of course, uh, battles in which we're doing this as much lead downfield as possible. There's not a lot of pinpoint stuff. But if you throw enough lead downfield, it does start to get ugly. These are some of the major battles of Frederick's reign. The ones in green are Prussian victories. The ones in black are Prussian defeats. The ones in blue are kind of seen as ties, historically. 
Again, I'm not expecting anybody to regurgitate these numbers, but look at that casualty percentage. It's very high. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 40% casualties. Well, once in a while they got lucky, Rossbach was a real <clears throat> lopsided victory for the Prussians. But even when they're winning, 17%, 19%, 22%. This, understand, in the modern, in modern parlance, these are absolute unmitigated disasters, casualty wise. Right? There will be a committee hearing. Yeah, that's somebody be somebody be fired and maybe court martialed for something this bad. Two percent. Yeah. So these are costly battles. These are ugly battles. And every time he goes out and he suffers these kinds of casualties, those trained guys that it took two years to get ready, well, in theory, 40% are gone. Now, in practice, of course, some are going to get wounded and come back. But as I said, the problem with this era is even getting wounded will often be enough to incapacitate you completely. Because if it hits a bone, that round ball, if it hits a bone, it's going to shatter it. Now, one last thought. This is a quote from Frederick. Once we're on the battlefield, discipline is absolutely steel. I mean, it's no one's moving. No one's moving, no one's leaving. And in fact, this painting, which unfortunately you can't see real well, the quality was pretty poor. But you can see this is the NCO with his rifle, making sure everybody's staying in line. That's what he's doing. He's going along, making sure everybody's staying in line. So, what is Russia's, or Russia, I keep saying Russia, Russia's strategic position? Well, let's look at a map. All right, this is the mess of the remnants of the Holy Roman Empire, okay? So the Kingdom of Prussia is this bit, plus this bit, plus this, 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 that, and that. It was a mess. It's a mess. Yeah. Because again, these are, this is all the, the leftovers from that Holy Roman Empire thing where there are hundreds of ind independent <coughs> principalities, duchies, kingdoms, you name it. And so he and his family have over generations inherited pieces of land, but it's not all together. It's not one big mass. So this is part of what has to explain why he has to be a good general. If he's not a good general, all those little detached territories those get gobbled up in a few seconds. And even one of the main parts of his kingdom here, East Prussia, is detached from the rest of his kingdom. So as one historian mentioned, he, uh, Prussia lives in a bad neighborhood. So you've gotta be ready to fight, okay? <coughs> but again, it's, it's a crazy, situation. Now, let's look at the major players in 1740, which is when he comes to the throne. What, what do the major players look like? <coughs> France is the most powerful nation in Europe in 1740. Okay? They have a population of about 20 million, an army of over 200,000, and that army, though, only makes up 1% of its population. This is going to be a key thing. How much of your armed forces are in your army? Now, why do you want a small percentage of your armed forces in your army? I'm sorry, why do you want a small percentage of your civilian population in your army? 
you still need to do labor like bread? Yeah, like you need farmers, that? you need merchants, you need craftsmen, you need all that stuff. And every person who's in the army and not doing a civilian job means your economy is weaker. Okay? Now, we're going to use France, which was the richest nation in Europe at that time, as a benchmark. We're going to say that's 100% revenue. Okay? So we're going to protect, we're, this is an artificial thing we're doing, but we're going to say France was the richest nation, so that's, that's what perfect looks like. That's what 100% looks like. So how do the other nations of Europe compare? Well, Britain, England, okay? Only 8 million people, only 40% of the economy of France. That's going to shift in a relatively quick period of time, in about 50 years. That's going to turn on its head. Okay? Only 36,000 people in their army, which is half a percent of their population. Okay? And again, no one's going to expect to regurgitate these numbers. I want you just to get a feel for Prussia and what Prussia is. Austria, 13 million people, only about a third of the economy. Want to see it that way? Um, France, 100,000 men, eighth of a percentage. Russia, almost the same population as France, but only a quarter of the tax revenue, 170,000, eighth of a percentage. And here's Prussia. Prussia's only got two and a half million people. Their economy is only about rounding up 12% of what France's is. At when he comes to the throne, there's only 99,000 people. He'll increase that number. But that's 4% of his population is in the army. And he's going to make that higher, which means a higher percentage are going to be in the army, which means those people aren't farmers, they aren't merchants, they aren't craftsmen, they aren't doing all the other things to keep the economic engine of the country going. That's not good, and Prussia knows that. Frederick is not stupid. I'll have a quote from him about that. Let's finish it off. Saxony, which is another Germanic state, they'll eventually be part of Germany, and Bavaria. So those are the major players in Europe at that time. And you can see these are the Germanic states, and of the three, or the four, Austria is by far the most powerful, and Prussia's a distant second in the Germanic states. So, Frederick on Russia's strategic position. Frederick thinks we're always, we the Prussians are always going to have to fight. Okay. The <clears throat> army has to get a private place. And that cultural trait will translate over from Prussia into Germany when Germany becomes a nation in 1871 and will help explain the militarism of the 20th century. Now, there are people who will do this whole Frederick the Great is responsible for the Holocaust. Okay, no, no, that's not how that works, okay? It, by that notion, some caveman named Thug is responsible for every bad thing that's ever happened. Right, I was gonna say, you just keep stacking that. All yeah, that as far as you want. You just keep going and going and going. All the way back to that one fist on quarter of the ocean. Yeah, exactly, that one uh, proto, whatever, proto lizard, that, or amphibian they call that, okay? But certainly the militarism of Prussia translates into the militarism of Germany, translates into things that do happen in the 20th century. Okay, we can see a line there. That doesn't automatically mean the guy on the furthest end of that line is guilty of all the crimes that the people that that end of the line did. But you can see a line. I mean, the Germans, as the, the uh, one of my colleagues who's a German specialist, he said the Germans were so obsessed with uniforms that any possible job that could have a uniform had a uniform, okay? That he, he said, and he said there's still a little of that. He was in Germany in the 80s, back when it was West Germany. And he said, even in Germany in the 80s, he said there was, 
weird jobs that had specific uniforms. Like, like the postman didn't just look like, you know, vaguely blue with an insignia on their shirt. It was more like an actual, there was like an actual uniform uniform for postmen. Like, you know, like they were going on parade or something. <laughs> it was, okay. So, if there is a Prussian way of war, what is it? I'll let Frederick tell you himself. <clears throat> short and lively. Did you hear the sustain much of us? Exactly. <laughs> and so the Prussians and the early Germans understand that. And all the early pre-World War I German wars are exactly that, short and lively. We have to think at the strategic level, what do we want? And then translate that into a war that gets us what we want as quickly and bloodlessly and cheaply as possible. And when the Germans slash Prussians think that way, they are successful. And when they forget that maxim, starting in World War I, they lose and lose badly. They destroy their country. And so Frederick understood that, that we're not in a position to have long wars. And even if we did, as he says, it destroys the discipline of the army, it depopulates the country, and it exhausts our resources. So why do it anyway? What could possibly be worth doing that to ourselves? The expression Pyrrhic victory, meaning you won, but you lost so much in winning that you basically lost? Frederick would totally have understood that. I mean, that was an expression that was used at his time, too. But um, he would totally get that. He would say yes. This big, long war, with any big, long war, is ultimately a Pyrrhic victory. Yeah, you won, but what did you win? So, this era that we've gotten into, the 1700s, is enlightened war. Okay, that's what it supposedly is, or limited war, or whatever the heck we're calling it. I want to let Sir Michael Howard offer his thoughts. of the enlightenment. And so this is the enlightened view of warfare. If war happens, somebody screwed up. A law was wrong, a perception was wrong, the vested interest went the wrong way. War should not automatically happen. So we go from the Middle Ages and the early modern period where war is, yeah, which is, it's, and it happens, and that's fine, there's no problem with it, <laughs> to War happens, but when it happens, somebody screwed up somewhere. Because we should have solved this problem through negotiations. Diplomacy is also really coming about during this era. A modern concept of diplomacy, and for instance, ambassadors being sacrosanct. You don't touch other people's ambassadors. Even if you're at war with them, you don't arrest them, you don't shoot them, you don't anything. Okay. So the whole concept of diplomacy is rising during this period of time. And this will last through World War One, and World War One will kind of destroy any concept of enlightenment, that we can be smart enough to solve our problems. People still try, but World War One kind of crashes down a lot of those ideas <clears throat> that we can somehow be smart enough as a, as a species to solve our problems without warfare. So we said there's an era of limited war. Well, it's limited in comparison to the previous century and compared to the next century. Then we always say that limited war is seen as controlled war, but do I find in here? That's yes, all. to a large degree, absolutely. So compared to the Thirty Years' War, where what was it, 20% uh, of Germany is, is slaughtered? Yeah, okay, this is limited. Compared to the French Revolution and the stuff that we're gonna talk about next? Oh yeah, it's limited, okay. 
Okay. French so in those French senses, French it is limited. Please, I'm sorry. The French Revolution was a mess. Yeah, that and that's what we're gonna we're gonna get into next. Okay, so it's certainly limited by comparison. There's an effort to curb anarchy, the concept of laws of nations and how nations themselves should behave is coming about. Like we said, diplomacy, all those kinds of things is coming about in this area. Don't just invade because you feel like invading. So what is like a, what is a reasonable reason to invade then? If you have something I want, you won't give it to me. Ah. But see, this is, I'm being reasonable about this. I want it. I tried to buy it from you. I tried to negotiate with you. And then I'm going to invade. We also have rules and procedures about how we fight war are starting to come about. This whole idea that our behavior as soldiers is also important. So we don't touch civilians. You leave civilians alone. I mean, one of the things about warfare, at, again, post Treaty of Westphalia, pre French Revolution, is we meet on a battlefield and we literally set a start time. I mean, it's that rigid in this era. So our two armies have maneuvered in the field, both trying to get the advantage, and eventually we, we get to a point where we clash. And once we meet up, they literally send out representatives on each side. Okay, we're gonna fight tomorrow. What time do you wanna begin? Is, is dawn too early? Do you wanna wait till noon? What do you wanna do? And we're, we have a field that we all agree on. And then there's a famous battle, and I can never remember the, never remember the name of the battle, but it's, it's like something referred to as the Battle of Manners or something like that, because both sides say, you go ahead and take the first shot. No, 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 you take the first shot. And they literally spend a half hour doing this. No, I, sir, sir, it would be impolite of me. This is your land. You should get the first I know, shot. I know why. Why? This isn't manners. It's, a, it's deniability. <laughs> but hey, they fight at us first, so we, we can slaughter them. Well, there might be some of that, too. This is the Mexican-American war. <laughs> <laughs> so th that's how disciplined these armies are. That the, the attitude is, no, 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 we're not going to take the first shot. You take the first shot. Oh, I can't shot. imagine oh, that right no. now. Napoleon changed this. Oh, yeah, that, this will all go out. Well, it will be the French Revolution. Napoleon just jumps on top of the French Revolution and rides it. Yeah. So, um, again, we have to do battle, but we only want to do battle when necessary. We need to accumulate territory. Remember, that, that hasn't gone away, what we said at the beginning of this lesson. That if I don't expand, you expand, and if you get bigger than me, you gobble me up. But I'm only going to do battle when I absolutely have to, because if I go to war with my smaller neighbor, okay, the Duchess here, I go to war with the Duchess, I gobble her up, but I'm now so weak, you could march in and take us both. So I'm going to be careful. I want that territory. But I also know if I'm too weak after gobbling up that territory, you're going to conquer me. I think that's how the Greek Empire came to be. But there is, to a certain degree, an element of the, the, the Greek city-states there. Not, not, it's not a 100% analogy because of the armies were different and stuff like I mean, that. I mean, literally, the Greek Empire, they, they left the, 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 the peninsula they were on because a larger force was taking them over. But when that force conquered, right. the business came back into the back. Yes. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's yeah. between the Spartans and the Athenians, that, that war. The Peloponnesian War, I think it is. Yeah. So, but again, so I'll do battle, but I have to be careful because if I it hurt myself too much, then I am now vulnerable and you waltz in and take two territories for almost nothing. Whereas you couldn't have even taken one before, now you can take two for, for almost nothing. And also, my, these huge armies that we've seen the previous century are limited by our logistics. Because we don't want to steal from the peasants, because as we talked about at the beginning of this lesson... Millions of pounds of grass. Yes, all that stuff, but then the peasants starve and it doesn't do me any good. Now I've got a barren territory with no one to farm it. I don't have extra population in my country. It's not like I can just send out 
tons of people to go out and farm. And again, somewhere, okay, I, we're not 90 something percent agriculture now, we're only like 80 something percent agriculture, okay? Things have gotten a little bit better since the Middle Ages when I said it was 95, 90, 95 percent are involved in agriculture. Well, now we're down to maybe only 80 percent agriculture. Well, that still stinks, okay? Com again, compared to what we're experiencing now, which is about a percent, percent and a half, do all our agriculture. That's reminds me, what about the land they choose to fight? Like, is that just ruined? Like, no, there's nothing to grow there? Uh, generally, they try to avoid cultivated areas, but sometimes if that's the best spot, they'll do it in a cultivated area thinking it's only one field. You know, it's not like I'm ravaging the whole countryside. One peasant farmer, man, that guy's screwed, but everybody else will be fine. Did you have your hand up? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, at this point, I mean, uh, no, no, no. There, this is before the age of conquest, except for the New World. The New World's already been taken care of by the Spanish. But Africa, other than a little bit in North Africa, nobody's touching. And Asia, they've sent out like merchants. So there's merchants and stuff going to Asia, but the British have not conquered India yet. Nobody's yet. All that is still pretty much just a little trade. That's all they're doing right now. Yeah, this yeah, this new fatal medicine called opium. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's going to start showing up in complicating things. Okay. So, and lastly, we're doing this seasonal warfare. We really only fight what what season? Summer. Summer. That's it. Winter, it's cold. There's no forage. Forget that. Spring, we got to do our planting. Can't do it there. Plus, it's raining, so it's all muddy. Fall, we gotta do our harvesting, and there's more rain, so can't do it then. So we are literally, we got like June through August, and that's it. Except for that time, we don't do warfare. There are exceptions, of course, but that's ideally when we do all our warfare, three months. So. End it with a moment of zen, and this is a quote from a French officer who was captured by the Prus Prussians at the Battle of Rossbach. And this is what he had to say after the, the battle was over. <laughs> now, it's an exaggeration, but why does he say this? What's the difference between the French army and the Prussian army? Organization, discipline. Organization, discipline. And who's with on campaign? When Frederick is on campaign, the army is on campaign. Despite the fact that he is the king, he does not have a retinue of servants and stuff. He sleeps in a tent, okay? A, a, a basic officer's issue tent. He doesn't have a huge, you know, like they're erecting a mini palace every night for him to sleep <laughs> in. He sleeps on a cot that's slightly better, but not radically better than his officer's sleep. Okay. Yes, does he have a few servants? Of course he does, he's the king. But the French are literally traveling with tens of thousands of servants. Um, women. And women as well. Yeah, with the French. And so that's where that officer's reply comes from. It's, um, he's looking at the other army and he's been captured, so he's behind the lines now and he's looking around and there's just tents. There's some tents, there's no... Whoa. There's, there's no caravan of people. What, what's going on here? And that's where he says, you're an army. We are not. So what It's not actual French... horse, right? There, <clears throat> there might have been. There might have been. <laughs> there might have been. It's the French again. Yeah, I, I'm not going to say never, say never. But yeah, it, it, they might have been. There might have been. It's the French. Yeah. But please, I'm sorry. You, um, started, you started asking a question. Go right ahead. I mean... It's about, you know, movement to go with a lot of people, you know, because you have to feed them. And, and that's, the, that's the whole problem. Yeah. So that's why it's absolute chaos behind the lines in the French army, because you've got all these extra people who aren't fighting. Yeah. yeah. They contribute zero to your army, <laughs> but you've got to feed them. You've yeah. got to clothe them. You've you got to protect them. them. Yeah. So it's just absolute chaos. The Prussians are focused. There's, all that other stuff is gone. We're on campaign, we're on campaign. That's it. 
Okay, so this this is what I call this lesson: Armies of the People and the Birth of Modern Operational Art. This is going to be the French Revolution and Napoleon. That's the if you want to just write the simple version: French Revolution and Napoleon. That's the fancy schmancy version. All right. Before we can launch into the French Revolution, we have to explain where did that come from? Because I should have just showed you in 1740, France was the richest, most powerful nation in Europe. How do they have a revolution in 1789, which is only 49 years later? How does that happen? Okay. The way it happens is that the French taxation system is fundamentally broken. It's fundamentally broken. The French have what are called the estates of France. This is, they divide all of society into three groups. Okay. The aristocracy, the clergy, everybody else. You've got one guess which one of those three groups pays all the taxes. Everybody else. Everybody else. Okay. That taxation system cannot go on indefinitely, especially when the French are constantly fighting wars, one place or another. And some historians have argued, and I think there's a little truth to it, I don't think it's 100%, that the American Revolution, ironically, the French supporting us was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think there's some truth to that, okay? It's the last of these major wars that they fight before the revolution starts. It also has a bunch of people spouting really crazy ideas like representative democracy and things like that. That's crazy talk. And some of the soldiers are bringing that crazy talk home. Anyway, it's the late 1780s. And again, the taxation system is broken. You're squeezing blood from a stone when it comes to the, uh, the everybody else category of France. So Louis the uh, 16th, who gets a really bad rap historically, Louis is actually on a personal level a very good man, morally a good man. Uh, he has no mistresses. He is devotedly in love with his wife. He loves his children. Um, he, he is not the brightest bulb. And there is serious thought now that he might have been on the autism spectrum. We can't prove it, but there is serious thought now that he was on the autism spectrum. His hobby, most king's hobbies are things that I can't necessarily talk about in a class. His hobby was clocks. He loved clocks. He built, repaired, and maintained clocks. That's what he did. Yeah. I don't know if I go that far, but but the analogy is interesting. Yes, um, the problem is France desperately needs a dynamic leader to guide them through the problems they're in. What about the last king before him? Was he dynamic? Uh, Louis the Fifteenth was pretty good. Hit the guy before him, Louis the Fourteenth, was one of the greatest kings France ever had. Um, the Sun King. Yes, the Sun King. Exactly. Um, so this is not really the guy you need. He really leans heavily on his advisors. And who are his advisors? Which estate do they belong to? The aristocracy. aristocracy. So how willing do you think they are to change the system and start paying taxes? Not that much. Okay. Well, Louis, Louis, is, you know, Louis the 16th. Louis the 16th. Well, that yes. <laughs> totally inaccurately. Yeah, right. That would have been more like Louis the 14th. Louis the Fourteenth would have done something like that. Yeah, he didn't have this. Which movie? Um, uh, History of the World, Part One, which there was never a part two, and I've always been disappointed by that. Anyway, his son. Yeah. Uh, it's good to be the king. Uh, anyway, so Louis is just—he's a good man morally and personally, but he's not what they need. He relies on his advisors. His advisors are all aristocrats. You, you see where this is going. <clears throat> now, in 1789, it gets so bad, he is forced to summon the Estates General. Now, the Estates General is kind of like a French Parliament. But Parliament, British Parliament, 
is elected. Now it's a very small percentage of the population can elect, but there is a vote, okay? And you get to pick, pick who your representative is. The Estates General, on the other hand, is summoned in the form of the Estates. So there are three voting groups in the Estates General, the aristocracy, the clergy, and everybody else. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. And so this is the first time in 175 years that the Estates General has been summoned. Okay? The French kings have for 175 years ruled without the Estates General, just doing whatever they darn well please. And that shows you how bad it is, where he's willing, even his advisors tell him, you gotta summon the Estates General. Because we need buy-in if we're gonna reform the tax system. Okay? We need buy-in. We need everybody on board with this. So he summons it. And the proposal goes forth. Let's start taxing the clergy and the aristocracy. And they take a vote. But here's the thing. You don't vote as an individual in the state's general. You vote by the state. So the overwhelming majority of the aristocracy vote, no, we're not changing the tax system. The slight majority of the clergy vote, no, we're not changing the tax system. And the overwhelming majority of the everybody else say, yes, let's reform the tax system. So they lose two votes to one. Okay. Now what happens then is the people who voted for the reform of the tax system, including almost half of the clergy and maybe about 10% of the aristocracy walk out. Okay. The people who voted for the change say this is not working, they walk out, and they find the largest indoor venue they can find that isn't a church, because that would be sacrilegious, so it's an indoor tennis court. Yes, tennis was played by, uh, by the French at this time. It had actually been played since the 1600s. Indoor tennis, it's, it has slightly different rules. I think you can bounce, it's sort of like a combination between racquetball and tennis. Because I think you can bounce the ball off the wall. I think that counts in indoor tennis. And then, believe it or not, there are, and even in the United States, there are indoor tennis courts like this with have that special European style rules. The racket's also different. So they get together here. This is a obviously a painting that's celebrating the whole moment. And if you can make it out here, this is a common guy. Here's an aristocrat, and here's a clergyman. The idea that we are actually all in this. No. Most of these guys aren't, and about half of these guys aren't, but, but we're all in this together. <laughs> this, is a, this is a dynamic thing. We're all gonna do it together. And they take the tennis court oath, and they basically say, we are not leaving. We are gonna work together to reform France, to make France a modern nation. And this is seen as the start of the French Revolution. The tennis court oath is seen as the start of the French Revolution. So, it starts to pick up pace real quickly after that. So 1789, we have the Estates General convening, we talked about that, we have the Tenth Court Oath, right. For two years, they are on track to create, to create a constitutional monarchy just like the British. And that's the goal, by the way, is to change France into a constitutional monarchy just like the British. That's what the people who are for these changes want. They don't want a republic. They're not doing anything radical like that. They just want a constitutional monarchy. The monarch's powers are lessened, and we have a, a more quasi-democratic system. That's the, the plan. For two years this is going on, and for two years Louis is being told by his advisors, you shouldn't put up with this. Your great grandfather, Louis XIV, would never have put up with this. Why are you putting up with this? Why are you putting up with this? For two years, they're whispering this in his ear. And after two years, he finally says, okay, you're right, what should I do? And they say, gather the royal family together, who will flee to the south of France, because the, the monarchy is more popular in the south of France. We'll raise an army, we'll come back, we'll put down this insanity in Paris, and we'll put things just like they were in the good old days. <laughs> okay. So, he and his family sneak out of Paris at night, and they stop at an inn. Now this, what I'm about to tell you is a story they tell in France, but everybody kind of recognizes. It's a little like 
Washington chopping down the cherry tree. There's a lot of myth in it, okay? They stop at an inn, and when they pay for their meal at the inn, they give a gold coin. And whose face is on the coin? George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Louis the four, Louis the sixteenth. Mm -hmm. So, supposedly the innkeeper looks at the coin, looks at the guy, looks at the coin. Excuse me, Monsieur. I'll be right back. And runs out and summons the local police. It would be militia to come and arrest him. That that's probably not exactly how it happened, but that's the story even they tell in France. Okay, that the, the coin and his face. The innkeeper recognizes him from the coin. I've seen enough coins that I'm pretty sure. It, yeah, I don't think I could pick out a person from a coin unless it's Queen Elizabeth, uh, because that was pretty obvious. Um, anyway, he's arrested then, he's considered a traitor for the revolution, and now we begin the radical phase of the revolution. Yes. The Jacobins and all that so, fun stuff. I'm confused one more time on yes, I'm who sorry. got arrested. Was Louis. it the king? Yes, the king is arrested. Okay, gotcha. He's arrested, was... and two years later, he's going to be executed. That's what, yes. Would have, so as the most popular king in France had, Louis XIV, I'm assuming he would have put up with it because he probably had a very popular. Louis XIV was smart enough, I would argue, yeah. that had he been in those situation, that situation, he would have found a way to make the old system work, or if it was untenable, he would have found a way to make a quasi-democratic system that really he was still running. He would have found some way to finagle stuff that. Oh, look, we've got this constitution and everything. Don't mind that guy behind that uh, big uh, tarp there. He's, there's nobody behind that curtain. Don't worry. That, that's my take on it. He was such a smart guy. He was always manipulating people. So I, I see him trying to manipulate the whole nation. In that he case. manipulated the nobles to move to Versailles. So. Just so I could keep an eye on him. Yeah. That was so. his whole reason. <laughs> he built the, the, this, the most oppressive palace in the world. Just so I can keep an eye on you guys, because I don't trust you. And then all those traditions, like, oh, the highest nobles get to dress me. Yes, exactly, all that stuff. And all the time, you're paying a fortune. You're draining your coffers just to stay there. <laughs> so if you're poor, you can't start a rebellion. Oh, this is smart game. Well, it's like my login. What's that? It's like my login. <laughs> <laughs> Much better. Much better. Okay, so. By 1792, 10,000 of the 11,000 regular army officers have left. Okay, so we're moving back to focus on the military. That was a broader thing. Now we're just going to focus on the military. So there were 11,000 officers in the French army. 10,000 of them have just left. Why did they leave? Who were they? Peasants. Uh, aristocrats. Uh, the aristocrats. Yeah. So they're not sticking around to see how this is going. Because remember, we're in the terror period of the revolution where people are being sent to the guillotine every day. Thousands of people are going to the guillotine. So these guys aren't waiting around to see how this happens. They're getting out of there, okay? By 1794, one third of company grade officers, company grade officers are lieutenants and captains, okay? Lieutenants and captains. One third of company grade officers are now elected. The rest are promoted simply by seniority. Okay. Now, neither of these is a good system. Simply promoting by seniority is not a good system, and election is not a good system. Election is the worst of the two. Why is it a bad idea to elect your officers? I mean, democracy is good, so why shouldn't we elect our officers? Because the officers that are good are thumbs up. But at the same time, they're what? More popular. Yes. They might not be the brightest bulb, but everybody likes them. Okay, okay. another I, reason, please? Okay, I don't know, but judging from what I read from the book, and this is that time era, no one wanted to become an officer and go for promotions because they were setting the soldiers to believe that if you became an officer, to treat them as traitors, to be easily replaced. Okay, that's part of it too, yes. Yeah. How are you now perceived? Of? Are, you, are you still one of us, or are you a traitor now? Now you're one of them. Yeah. As opposed to one of us, absolutely. There's a lot Everybody of distrust with the They yeah. did not, they wanted oh. all the loyalty yes. to the government. I mean, in that period, yes, everyone's paranoid. Yes, during the terror, everyone's paranoid. Yeah, because somebody can say like, hey, you're a traitor. Yeah. 
It's like living in Nazi Germany or living in the Soviet Union. You're constantly worried about, you know, or what? McCarthyism. McCarthyism, exactly. You're co constantly worried about, whoa, if I say the wrong thing, am I going to be executed? Am I going to be fired, et cetera, et cetera? No, Same thing with the officers to the soldiers. They could be stripped of their aristocrat titles. Yes. And imprisoned. Yeah, absolutely. Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah. Napoleon. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Napoleon, yeah. So, so, yes. And then one last thing I throw out there is how... It's hard if you were, if these were your buddies, and now you're in charge, to order those guys to go to their death, or just to discipline them, is hard. You know what, I need you to dig a latrine. And he'd say, dude, I remember you when we were drunk, and we were, I ain't digging a whole latrine, screw you. How do I, how do I discipline them? I know them, they're my friends. Now, how do I do discipline? How do I? How do I get respect from them? So that's another issue. So again, this is, we did, we tried this during the American Revolution, uh, not the American Revolution, during the Civil War. The beginning phases of the Civil War, we did this a little, and it generally didn't work very well because of the, all the issues we talked about. Yeah. Please? Oh no, I was just saying, yeah, this way. Yeah. All right, uh, and then promoting by seniority is a better system, but it's not great because just having a pulse and being around is not, That's it's not, not the reason you should promote people. He did die. Yeah, he hasn't managed to get himself killed. Maybe he didn't manage to get himself killed because he's incompetent. And he's never in the right place at the right time to save us, too. And so he just keeps surviving. So, yeah, that's not a great idea either. By 1795, the average age of a general officer in the French army is 33. I use, when I taught at Leavenworth, I'd always look around the room and say, okay, how many of you guys are 33 or older? And almost all the hands would go up and I'd look at them and go, losers, that's what you all are, losers. You're only majors, okay? <laughs> but, and it's the French army. Yeah, okay. And again, because all the aristocrats are gone and the few aristocrats who stayed or the new guys are getting promoted very rapidly. Yeah, I just checked real quick. Average age of an officer in the military, 33. If, if it's overall. Yeah. Yes, overall. Yeah. Okay, oh, sorry. Um, in the same book, they told the general executive and the, the Navy, all the, the French Navy suffered, you know, all these changes, or it was more, you know, more weakened because the, you know, the, the women, were more like the more glorious to the you know, famous uh, officers. Right. Yeah, there were issues. The Navy had different issues. Yeah. <clears throat> and one of them, I mean, I think uh, one of the key issues with the Navy is you actually have to know how to run a ship. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not like the Army where we can just pour in all these guys and here's your musket, figure it out. How do you even, like, if you put me on a ship, <laughs> a sailing ship, I don't even know how to get out of port let alone fight a battle on a ship. Yeah. Like, okay, I think we raise the sails, right? No, we lower the sails. Is it, no, we want them, okay, we want them open. So whatever that's called, lowering? Yeah, let's do that. I mean, it would be, eh, 